So welcome back to the Globalization Week of URAC Research to our evening session tonight. Tonight we are talking about the iconic topic par excellence, which is the future of globalism, together with one of the leading, if not the leading scholar in global analysis and globalization, Manfred Steger. Manfred Steger is a professor uh, at, of sociology at the University of Hawaii in Manoa. He's also a professorial fellow at Western Sydney University. And last but not least, but the most pleasant uh, news in my view is that he's our distinguished global fellow 2021 at the Center for Advanced Studies. Manfred, we are so happy to have you. I cannot express our gratitude and um, the asset you represent for us. So uh, we are really honored to work with you on important topics, um, given that Manfred is one of the scholars that has coined uh, the discipline, the meta discipline of global studies and who has written most or many of the path breaking volumes on the topic of global analysis, including uh, the introduction to globalization with Oxford University Press and many others. Most recently, Manfred concentrated on what he calls the disjunctive globalization. I had the pleasure to quote his approach in my introductory lecture, but now uh, let's uh, give the stage uh, to Manfred Steger for the lecture, The Future of Globalism. Manfred, take the stage, please. Thank you very much, Roland. Uh, and thank you to uh, the team uh, at the Center for Advanced Studies uh, at URAC Research uh, for inviting me uh, to give this lecture. And most importantly, uh, thank you, all of you who are tuning in. Uh, I very much appreciate your taking the time and listening to me uh, tonight. So, guten Abend, buonasera, good evening. My topic for today is the future of globalism, uh, ism, in other words, uh, the ideology that puts globalization, the concept, at its very core. Uh, and I think we all know that con contrary to the claim that uh, we are at the end of ideology, a claim that was very, made very famous about 30 years ago uh, by Francis Fukuyama, uh, we are not at the end of the ideology. It, as a matter of fact, we are finding ourselves in these uh, uh, sort of in this beginning of the 21st century involved in an ideological struggle. So it's almost the opposite. Ideologies have diversified. They have not gone away. They're competing with each other for a global audience and for a national audience and local audience at the same time. They're being mediated in this struggle by new technologies, which have played an enormous role. So in order to understand and speculate on the future of globalism, what we have to do is we have to first take a look at the status quo. Where, where are we? And once we understand where we are or lay out where we are, it's going to be easier for us to understand where we might be going. So the first part uh, of this talk will be about taking stock with regard to globalism where do we stand and how is globalism related to globalization? And the second part, the longer part of my talk, will then uh, talk about the future of globalism in terms of five future scenarios that I will lay out for you. And hopefully that will be enough food for discussion and uh, Q&A uh, after my presentation. So let me please, uh, at this point, uh, share my screen with you. I've prepared a very short PowerPoint because I think that some of the visual uh, representations are very important here. So uh, first of all, how is globalism related to globalization? Those of you who have uh, read my work know my definition of globalization. For me, globalization is a process or a set of processes, obviously multidimensional processes. That are, that are about the expansion and intensification of connectivities and mobilities and imaginaries, consciousness, across world space and world time. Now, the easiest way 
to think about globalization is to analytically split it into two large aspects. The first one are objective processes. And here I'm referring to the uh, connectivities and mobilities, the flows of capital, goods, services, technologies, and people. The second uh, aspect, which is the one that I'll be concentrating on, and it's also the aspect that I have spent most time uh, writing about, are subjective processes. And they refer to flows and mobilities and connectivities of ideas, ideologies, meanings, symbols, narratives, and imaginaries. And you can see that I highlighted ideologies here because globalism, the topic of my talk tonight, is uh, an ideology. So what do I mean by ideologies, so-called isms? For me, ideologies are shared mental maps that help people, ordinary people, to navigate the complexity of their political universe. And obviously they carry claims to social truth. In other words, those claims are being accepted by significant groups in society as true. They consist of patterned ideas and norms. And that of course also includes importantly, particular representation of power relations. Now ideologies have very important functions. So uh, Paul Ricoeur, one of the, uh, I think, uh, very uh, famous uh, French philosophers talked about some of these functions. Political ideologies, they explain in certain ways social reality. And they explain it in, by simplifying social reality in terms of certain kinds of claims or certain kinds of concepts that are being defined and are being conveyed to people, to audiences as we said, as social truth. They orient people towards certain concepts, towards certain norms and ideas. And perhaps most importantly, ideologies motivate people to act politically. In other words, ideologies are not just uh, uh, sort of ideas that float on uh, ether. They really are connected to social practice, to political practice in terms of engaging people in social action. Now, my argument has been that political ideologies sit on deeper layers of what I call social imaginaries. Now, these imaginaries are really deep-seated modes of understanding reality, social reality, that set the parameters within which people imagine their social whole. So their sense of community, we are socialized into it. That's why I say they are pre-reflexive. In many ways, they're taken for granted. What is normal? What goes on between us? What sorts of actions can I engage in and not engage in? Uh, what, who are the members of my community? What sort of community do I belong to? How do I distinguish us from them? All of that is part of the social imaginary. Now, I argue that in the last few decades, the color or the substance of the social imaginary, remember, deep-seated ways of imagining the social whole, slowly shifted from a national imaginary, in other words, an understanding of community primarily and sometimes almost exclusively just in national and local terms to a global imaginary. In other words, deep-seated ways of beginning to imagine the whole of society in increasingly global terms, global community, global citizenship. The global, this adjective, attached itself increasingly to terms that were previously linked to the national or national imaginations. And even though the global has not yet become dominant in a sense that it has replaced the national imaginary, the global increasingly is bubbling up from within the national, from within the local. We all know the term glocalization or the glocal as indicating that dialectic, that interdependence between the global and the local and the national. So increasingly the national has become unsettled. 
it has again, it has not been replaced by the global, but increasingly people are capable of seeing themselves, even if their attentions as at the same time belonging to a local community a national community and the global community. And I think global problems like transnational terrorism or climate change or food crises or inequality, think of the global financial crisis of 2008, have contributed to people's understanding to a burgeoning of consciousness in a global direction. So it's a messy sort of identification at this point. It is still largely oriented towards the national and the local, but increasingly the global community or a global sense of interdependence is beginning to unsettle that exclusive national identification. Now, what is the link then to globalism here? Well, this is a very important argument that I've made in my previous work. What I'm arguing is that social imaginaries, and remember, they can be national or global. Actually, since they are the deep-seated pre-reflexive parameters with which people understand their sense of belonging and community, they are being translated and articulated into concrete political agendas and programs by political ideologies. So political ideologies, I argue, are translators and articulators of this underlying imaginary. Now, if we are talking about the national imaginary, what you can see is that under the national imaginary sit the ideologies that we've all known from the 19th and 20th century. Liberalism, conservatism, socialism, fascism, communism, all of those anarchism, all of those isms, I argue, translate and articulate primarily a national sense of community. So you get British uh, liberalism, you get French conservatism, you get socialism in one country, or socialism with Chinese characteristics. You get Italian fascism, German national socialism, and so on. I argue that even socialism that is uh, apparently claims to be international in reality was always articulated in national terms. The Swedish welfare state or the Scandinavian welfare state versus other forms of socialism, as I said, uh, say socialism in one country. Now, these uh, old ideologies that are connected to the national imaginary, let's call them conventional traditional ideologies, I argue have increasingly been unsettled. You remember the national uh, imaginary is being unsettled by the global. So the way we saw this is that by the 20th century, especially the second half of the 20th century, increasingly these traditional ideologies were prefixed by neo. So we got neoliberalism, neoconservatism, neo-Marxism. And the question of, of course is, what is neo? Apparently people realized, enough people realized that there was something new that was happening. The ideological landscape was shifting. Their ideologies were new, they were being remade, they were being reconfigured. I argue what was new is the rising global imaginary that increasingly put globalization, the concept, the buzzword of the 1990s, at the core of understanding community and our place in it. So we saw the rise of new isms, of neo-isms, market globalism, justice globalism, and religious globalism. I argue those are the three main neo-isms that emerged in the late 20th, early 21st century that were connected to the global imaginary. In other words, they were articulating and translating what was increasingly becoming a global imaginary 
into concrete political agendas and programs that were competing with each other. So market globalism was competing with justice globalism, competing with religious globalism, but what they had in common is that they all translated a global imaginary in ideological terms. As we shall see, on the national imaginary side, there was also the formation of a new ideology that I call anti-globalist populism that was in a way wrestling with those new isms, these neo-isms and competing with them, trying to pull back into a national imaginary. It defined itself in its opposition to the global. We'll get back to that. First, let's spend a little bit of time on these isms, because these are really important. And for us to understand what the future of globalism will hold, we have to know a little bit about these uh, neo-isms. So, as I argued, market globalism emerged in the late 1980s as the dominant ideology that endowed globalization, which was the core concept, with free market norms and meanings. And who endowed market globalism? with these meanings, I argue global power elites that included corporate managers, politicians, state bureaucrats, journalists, public intellectuals, celebrities. And they were supported in this uh, process by the corporate media, the global corporate media that saturated the public discourse with idealized images of a consumerist, globally integrated market world. So I studied hundreds of uh, utterances and speeches and websites, newspaper articles, both online and offline, of these discourses of market globalism. And what I found was that there were five central claims that made up the morphology, the shape, the structure of this ideology that were repeated over and over again. These were claims that a lot of people in society either believed they were true or came to believe that they're true. I just very briefly give you those five claims. Globalization was the first claim is about the liberalization of trade and the global integration of markets. That was the foundational claim. Globalization, they argued, is inevitable and irreversible. It's like, uh, bad weather, there's nothing we can do about it. We can either jump on the train or be rolled over by the train. Nobody had a choice. It was very, very deterministic, very reminiscent of Marxism or certain forms of orthodox Marxism in that regard. The third claim was that nobody's in charge of globalization. In other words, the argument was that free markets are self-organizing. There's no single cabal or no government or no world entity that is actually steering that, no country that's in charge. Increasingly, the market is in charge of governments. Globalization benefits everyone. That was an important thing to persuade people to come on board with this ideology, that they too would benefit in the long run from the marketization, the integration of global markets, the reduction of tariffs and so on. And finally, the last claim was that globalization furthers the spread of democracy in the world. In other words, free markets and democracy were used as interchangeable terms. And the argument was that without free markets, you can't have democracy. Therefore, to democratize the world meant to actually marketize the world along the lines of the neoliberal program of deregulation of industries of privatization of state-owned enterprises and of liberalization of trade. So those were the five major claims that make up the core of this ideology. Over the last two decades, and you can see that uh, or over the next couple of decades, you can see that uh, uh, market globalism, however, was challenged. We remember the massive justice globalist protests starting in 1999 in Seattle and spreading around major cities in the world. And also challenged from the right, 
by religious globalism, a particular form of religious globalism, and I'll get back to that, called jihadist globalism, engaging in transnational acts of terrorism. So while market globalism was still dominant, by the late 1990s, 2000s, it was being challenged. So let's first take a look at the challenge of justice globalism very briefly. Justice globalism refers to the political ideas and values that are associated with social alliances known as the global justice movement, right? Uh, it emerged in the 1990s as a progressive network of international non-governmental organizations, activist groups that linked up across uh, national boundaries. They were dedicated to the establishment of a more equitable relationship, especially between the global north and the global south. And they agitated for things like uh, protecting the global environment, fair trade and international labor issues, human rights, women issues. So uh, th there was even a new forum th that was being created, the World Social Forum that met in the global south that was very consciously established as a parallel organization to the World Economic Forum, which was the main ideological site of market globalism in Davos, Switzerland, not too far from uh, obviously where uh, you are if you are in uh, Bolzano Boltz at the moment. And in the 2010s, we saw this justice globalist movement or justice globalism morph into uh, an Occupy movement. You remember in the wake of the 2008 global financial crisis, Occupy Wall Street burst, in, burst into the political scene and again was sort of multiplied uh, in very similar movements around the world. It was inspired by the uh, popular Arab Spring protests in the Middle East or Los Indignados uh, demonstrations in Spain. Again, they expressed their outrage at what they saw the inequalities of uh, market globalization. Of course, the slogan was, we are the 99%, and the struggle was against the 1%. So what are their basic claims? Again, uh, I did uh, quite a lot of discourse analysis on it, and I came up with five claims again. The first claim, and they're all, in, of course, in reaction to market globalism, right? So the first claim is that neoliberalism produces global crises. And obviously the global financial crisis was the big one. Second claim was that market-driven globalization has increased worldwide disparities in wealth and well-being. So this really counters the claim that it actually benefits everyone. The third claim was that democratic participation is essential in solving global problems. The fourth claim is that another world is possible and urgently needed. In other words, they were not against globalization. They were only against the form of globalization that was pushed by market globalism. So in other words, they too translated the underlying global imaginary into an alternative ideological agenda. And final claim was people power, not corporate power. An understanding that globalization has to proceed from below, not from above. It had to be democratic. It had to be uh, in the hands of people, ordinary people, and they needed to benefit from it. Religious globalism, the challenge from the right, obviously, was crystallized in the early 2000s around, uh, uh, and in the 2010s as well, around very specific uh, examples. The most a uh, spectacular one was, of course, Islamic examples of organizations like ISIS or Al-Qaeda or Boko Haram that subscribe to a particular violent form of religious globalism. But it is not just confined to is Islam. Other religious, religiously inspired versions of uh, religious globalism include uh, Christian groups like the Army of God or Christian identity in the United States, the Mormon Church, Falun Gong, Aum Shinrikyo in Japan, and even some Jewish organizations like Chabad, an Orthodox Jewish movement with global ambitions and global, a global presence. Now, of course, the most important one of these was what I call jihadist globalism, uh, the uh, ideology of ISIS and Al-Qaeda, 
And that is anchored in two main concepts, the Ummah, which is the Islamic community of believers, and that's envisioned as a global community. You can see how the underlying imaginary here is global. And Jihad, again, an armed and unarmed struggle against unbelief around the world. So Jihadist globalism claim to return power back to the Muslim masses around the world. And it took place, this agitation, in global space, emancipated from the territoriality of just one particular place. In other words, they were not mimicking the secular nationalist movements that might have been inspired by some of the same visions that confined themselves in national terms. In other words, they were translating the national imaginary. In the case of religious globalism, jihadist globalism, we are talking about global space. So jihadist globalism still retains some potent metaphors that of course must resonate with people's national and local identities, but its chilling vision contains an ideological alternative to both market globalism and justice globalism that imagines community in unambiguously global terms. That's what I call the great uh, ideological struggle of the 21st century between market globalism, justice globalism, and religious globalism. Enter the 2010s and you get a fourth challenger, a challenger that is not translating the global, but wants to return to and translates a national imaginary that obviously has been impact, impacted quite severely by the rise of the global. So what the challenge of anti-globalist populism is all about, and this was the uh, topic that I presented uh, at a similar conference uh, here at URAC two years ago, so I'm going to keep it very short, was basically uh, uh, triggered, I would argue, by the economic con uh, consequences of the global financial crisis and the European sovereign debt crisis that hit people really hard. There was a general failure of the neoliberal uh, market globalist establishment to punish the financial sector for its economic irresponsibility. Ordinary people's idea in or beliefs in the claims of market globalism gave, gave way to widespread fears that this great experiment of transcending the nation state had spiraled out of control and needed to be curbed. So they were beginning to accuse those globalist cosmopolitan uh, elites of cheating them. And authoritarian politicians around the world capitalized on this popular discontent by promising the forgotten people a return to national control. And of course, the election of Donald Trump in the United States in 2016, uh, Brexit, the rise of Viktor Orban in, in Hungary, Marine Le Pen, uh, and even in Asia, uh, if you think of the Philippines uh, and, and other example was actually, interestingly enough, around the world, we saw this sort of turning back to the national imaginary. Uh, so we had, uh, uh, even in, in uh, Latin America, South America, if you think of Ivan Duke's uh, Colombia, uh, examples of this turning back. And in my work, I concentrated especially on what I call the anti-globalist populism of Donald Trump. And in this regard, I just want to give you very quickly what I found in analyzing various speeches that Trump gave over the last four years, even you know, going back to 2016 when he ran for president until uh, uh, now uh, when he was voted out of office. Uh, these are some of the core concepts that I found in anti-globalist populism. Trump activated this idea, which is an old populist idea, that the ordinary people had to struggle against uh, elites. Elites were both domestic and international. That policy should be made by the people. So the general will of ordinary people, as he defined them, uh, should prevail. The enemy was globalization and globalism. And uh, his uh, adjacent concepts to the core concepts, as you can see, 
were things like immigration, open borders, which he was against. So he defined very much anti-globalist uh, populism in terms of being against things, against uh, doing something about climate change. The argument was climate change is not real. It's only part of the progressive elites uh, arguments. Uh, he was in favor of sovereignty against what he called fake global news in favor of independence as he saw it. Economic nationalism, of course, plays very much into it. Uh, he was in favor of uh, uh, curbing trade or as he saw it, striking new trade deals. If you remember, he took uh, the United States out of the TPP, for example, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So his main claim really was Americanism, not globalism will be our creed. So you can see how anti-globalist populism puts globalization right at the core and sees itself as opposing, as defeating globalism and its alleged treacherous elites that are connected to it. So the future has to be a glorious rebirth of the nation, right? Make America great again, make Hungary great again, make uh, uh, Italy great again, whatever it might be. And it would be a mistake to think that uh, Trump uh, was just a rhetorician. In other words, that he just made these claims and there was really no policy substance to it. Let's remember that even though we may not agree with his policies, and I assume a lot of us don't agree, they were substantive. In other words, his anti-globalist populism was strong enough in ideology to actually come up with a very substantive uh, political program, such as reconfiguring of international alliances. You can see the anti-globalist thrust here, the imp imposition of trade tariffs, especially the, the starting of the trade skirmish with China, the withdrawal from Paris Agreement, uh, climate agreement, and the weakening of the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, the nomination of ultra conservative judges. I already talked about the abandonment of the TPP, the weakening of Obamacare, the cutting of taxes and the deregulation. That's one neoliberal uh, element that he retained, but it was again, just confined to the United States, especially the cutting of corporate taxes from 35% to 21%. So let's not, sort of poo-poo uh, uh, anti-globalist populism is just rhetoric, it's just, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, performance. It actually has policy substance to it. Okay, so these are now the parties in this great ideological struggle that I see unfolding over the next, next decade or longer. Again, Market globalism, dominant certainly until the uh, global financial crisis and still a major player. Justice globalism, the challenge from the political left. Religious globalism, challenge from the right. All three of those are translating an underlying global imaginary into concrete and competing political programs and agenda. And then the rise of anti-globalist populism that competes against all three in terms of seeking to gain an upper hand in this ideological struggle by translating a national imaginary, strengthening a national imaginary and, and, uh, and motivating, mobilizing that uh, against a global imaginary. So we now move into the second part here about the future of globalis uh, globalism. We're now in, an, in a position where we can actually sort of think about, speculate about where globalism is, is, will be going, say in the next decade or two. So there are a number of questions that I will pursue. Will the anti-globalist populist surge of the 2010s turn out to be a short-lived protests against the dislocations brought by neoliberal globalization or might it achieve ideological dominance? In other words, might we see the turning of the wheel back to a much more national imaginary and a situation that resembles more the sort of uh, imaginary that uh, we used to from the 19th and 20th century? Can the clock be turned back? Second question, will market globalism face marginalization 
or might it stage a successful comeback in the 2020s and beyond? In other words, can it sort of rebuild itself, reconfigure itself, and gain the upper hand again on that ideological stage? Third, could the sagging fortunes of justice globalism, which is not doing very well at the moment, experiencing a rebound? Considering intensified global problems such as climate change, inequality, and pandemics, can that actually hurt the challenge, uh, help the challenge from the left? Or is justice globalism sort of marginalized, sidelined for a long time? And finally, what about religious globalism? Could perhaps religious globalism, globalism be the main beneficiary of an increasingly chaotic world, if that's what we are facing, that's teetering at the brink of environmental, nuclear, or a health apocalypse? So those are sort of the guiding questions that I want to put before you as we move into what I want to identify as five future scenarios for globalism. So you can see the first scenario I call anti-globalist populism prevails. The second scenario, market globalism rebounds. The third scenario is justice globalism resurgent. The fourth scenario is religious globalism intervenes. And the fifth future scenario is what I would call an ideological stalemate. And you can see that three of these scenarios have an asterisk connected to them. Scenario one, scenario two, and scenario five. Those are the ones that I will be concentrating on. And I will let you know why I think that scenario three and scenario four are less likely, but I will still touch on them as well. But let's start with Future scenario one, anti-globalist populism prevails. In this scenario, the populist challenge succeeds in dominating its ideological competitors. That means that, um, that by the, uh, in, in the decade of the 2020s, we'll see a return to the national imaginary. Now, in his celebrated book, The Great Transformation, uh, the great political economist Karl Polanyi explained how the unbridled principles of free markets and free market thinking and policy uh, framework destroyed complex European social relations of mutual obligation and undermines communal values, such as civic engagement, reciprocity, and redistribution. You remember Polanyi saying that as large segments of the population find themselves without adequate system of social security and communal support, they ra rally typically behind hypernationalist political leaders that promise the curbing of the dynamics of marketization. In other words, they offer protection. Now, like its 19th century predecessor, market globalism of the 1990s and 2000s represents an excessive experiment in unleashing the utopia of a self-regulating market on society. In fact, the acolytes of market globalism were prepared to turn the entire world into their laboratory. And the reaction predicted by Polony was actually relatively swift. In the context of these various crises, whether it's the terrorism crisis or whether it's the global financial crisis or the current uh, coronavirus crisis that I call the great unsettling, the social context, especially the unsettling of various imaginaries, it was the anti-globalist message of providing nationalist protection that made the most gains. It appealed to many ordinary people around the world who favored a retreat into the familiar. And I think we can't blame them. If we are faced with crisis, if we are faced with danger, very often retreat into the familiar, in this case, the national imaginary and its articulations seems to be a safe bet. So what could the ideological consequences be if anti-globalist populism prevails in the next decade? This scenario suggests that all three forms of globalism would suffer. In other words, 
market globalism, justice globalism, religious globalism, obviously because of the uh, strength of the national imaginary. To explain this outcome, let's just consider three social dynamics that augment the staying power of anti-globalist populism. So the three dynamics that I think are really critical here is first, the multiplication of restrictions on major forms of mobility. Mobility of people, mobility of objects, mobility of institutions uh, are primary here. Second, the decline of representative democracy and the corresponding surge of illiberal authoritarianism. And the third social dynamic, the failure to build new international institutions capable of tackling the mounting global problems. So let's start with the first dynamic, the growth of restrictions of global mobility, such as the movement of goods, services, uh, money, and so on. The populist surge of the last four years has already provided us with some warning signs. More intense border controls and national security measures at the world's major airports and seaports have made international movements and trade more cumbersome. Most importantly, populist leaders like Trump see global trade as a zero-sum game between self-interested nations. Thus, they are prepared to impose steep tariffs on goods and services. We've seen that, right? And the trade deficit, of course, is always cited as one of the reasons for that. One can easily imagine a full-blown trade war that might draw other countries and regions into its orbit. For all the inequalities that are created by unbridled free market capitalism, the history of the 20th century teaches us that trade protectionism often fuels a logic of nationalist competition that rarely remains confined in the economic sphere, right? We're talking about political tensions that arise. And this applies even more in our present era of multiple national powers like China and Russia who compete for honor and influence on the world stage. So with the world largest war making arsenal at the command of an unpredictable populist leader as it was in the last four years in Trump, there is a good possibility, right, that uh, real or perceived threats to American economic dominance may turn into military confrontation. And of course, the same troubling outlook with regard to the growth of restrictions on mobility, in this case, we talked about uh, trade and goods, also holds true for restrictions on transnational movement of people in the form of business travelers, tourists, economic migrants, and political refugees. And we've seen that now in an extremely severe form as a result of our next crisis, right? The coronavirus uh, crisis. But we already saw it before. Think of the 2015 Syrian refugee crisis or the 2018-19 Latin American migrants uh, at the Mexican border that's now picked up again. Or the throngs of African migrants that are crossing the Mediterranean in pursuit of a dream for a better life. These restrictive developments, right, spell a future characterized by widespread curtailment of the movement of human bodies in ways that perhaps we can even not comp uh, comprehend at the moment, especially as a result of COVID. And national populists are very skillful in exploiting people's legitimate fears of the social and cultural consequences of large numbers of newcomers that are seen as undesirable. So the latest data on digital global flows show that the dominant form of contemporary globalization today is disembodied globalization. And as Roland referred to my latest work on disjunctive globalization, I'm arguing that disembodied globalization, digital globalization is increasingly becoming more powerful and eats into other forms of globalization like embodied globalization, the movement of people across borders. And this means that that techno trend too plays into the possibility of restrictions on movement. Okay, okay. now the second uh, dynamic that we have to think about also 
is, if you remember, uh, when I uh, introduced the first two, is the decline of representative democracy and the correspondent surge of illiberal uh, uh, populism. This also plays into this scenario one. And I think the way it plays into the scenario one, I think is very uh, uh, clear. Recent empirical data drawn from major democratic countries around the world confirm a loss of legitimacy. Uh, in other words, people increasingly trust their governments less. And that's specifically true for democratic countries. Right. So many ordinary people see uh, what they uh, uh, sort of condemn as a power grab, an illeg illegitimate power grab by elites, either within the country, think of Brussels and the role of Brussels in the European Union, or outside of the countries. In other words, elites, international elites are being accused of taking away uh, the will of the people, the national people. There's an argument of a lack of accountability and transparency that provides anti-globalist populists with a welcome opportunity to demand a return of power to national communities. And we saw this discourse played out in the case of uh, Brexit, especially. So drastic times require drastic actions, those populists argue, and thus they support an expansion of executive power in the hands of patriotic leaders like Trump or Orban. Trump, who on January 6th was ready to support basically a putsch, a coup, and Orban was already paralyzed and sidelined his national parliament. And interestingly enough, the European Union has not yet seen fit to really, really put tremendous sanctions on this move, which is an interesting thing we might want to talk about a little bit later. And he openly talks, Orban openly talks about a liberal democracy. So this is really the, the second social dynamic that speaks for scenario one or, or fuels scenario one. The third social dynamic is the loss of momentum in building new global governance structures and transnational institutional networks that are capable of coordinated action to solve the major problems of our time. And of course, climate change tops the list of pressing issues. Right? Even though we had the Paris agreements in December 2018, even though the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is warning that we already, if not have already surpassed the 1.5 degrees warming, we are very close to it. We are not seeing the kind of action that you would expect the sense of urgency given the current situation. I mean, one stunning uh, data in all of this, right, is that anything over 1.5 uh, degree warming would destroy 99% of the world's coral reefs. And I think we all know what that means with regard to our atmosphere, with regard to life on Earth on this planet. So the persistence, even worsening of other global problems, such as the new pandemic, right, uh, COVID pandemic, combined with the refusal of populists to tackle these global issues in a systematic way suggests that anti-globalist populism may actually, in many ways, run into problems as well. In other words, if they don't solve global problems, they may be perceived as illegitim illegitimate as well. As problems worsen, populism might falter and reveals itself perhaps as just the last gasp of the national imaginary. Now, this would move us perhaps into scenario two, which I want to discuss just a little bit. And that is market globalism rebounds as a result perhaps of uh, the national populace not being able to solve these problems and increasingly being seen as incompetent or unwilling to take them on and therefore suffering that legitimate deficit. So the, scenario two builds on the possibility of massive and persistent losses of anti-globalist populists at the ballot box, right? As a result of their failure to tackle these issues. And such a market globalist rebound scenario might actually have already started with the defeat of Donald Trump last year in the United States. 
And perhaps that has also some sort of signal to the rest of the world, we have to see. But the question would be, what sort of political ideology would take the place of anti-globalist populism? And in this scenario, it would be uh, market globalism, but there are actually two possibilities. The first possibility might be perhaps not market globalism, but a new form of left-wing populists. And I think that President Joe Biden is an example, at least a moderate example of this possibility perhaps by taking on a lot of the program that was put on the table by Bernie Sanders, uh, right? Uh, even though he strongly opposes the xenophobic and anti-pluralist message of national populism, he does embrace a lot of the 20th century Keynesian ideals of strong nation states that are committed to regulate capitalism for the benefit of working people. So in other words, he's also turning to a sort of a national imaginary, but a national imaginary that of course is not as extreme as anti-globalist populism. So one option might be that the ideology that replaces anti-globalist populism would be a much milder left-wing form of populism. The second option would indicate actually a different thing, which would mean that market globalism is bouncing back and it's bouncing back as a result of reinventing itself. So here's, here's how I see that. And you could call it maybe a reformed market globalism or a market globalism with a human face. Having been confronted with a populist backlash, newly empowered market globalists in the 2020s might exert more caution and make some adjustments rhetorical and policy-wise to their ultimate goal, which is the creation of a single global market. Most likely they would pledge to restore the liberal post-war international order of the past and propose more socially responsible forms of neoliberal globalization to the public. And I think there's already ample evidence for this kind of course. For example, many market globalism, globalists today already conceded that globalization has been badly mismanaged. Think of Joe Stiglitz, for example, and requires serious overhaul. Still though, they insist that the original project of liberalizing trade and integrating markets is still valid. So at the end of that day, their agenda is to stabilize globalizing capitalism, to keep translating and articulating a global imaginary. I think the programmatic outline for such a reformed market globalism for the 2020s scenario two is already in the making at some important ideological sites. Most importantly, I think the World Economic Forum. And I'm thinking here specifically of, um, of Klaus Schwab, uh, Schwab, who is the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. And he has this new vision, right? He calls it globalization 4.0. As a matter of fact, that was the official the uh, theme of the 2019 annual meeting in Davos before the pandemic hit. So for reformist market globalists like Schwab, what he calls the fourth industrial revo revolution amounts to a complete digitization of the social, political, and economic. That's how he put it. And this revolution is set to transform existing social structures in profound ways that I think were debated at this conference already that would blur the lines between physical, digital, and biological spheres, right? We're talking 3D printing, autonomous vehicles, artificial intelligence, internet of, all, uh, internet of things, uh, uh, quantum computing, and so on. Now, Schwab asserts that the production and exchange of physical goods matters less and less, which is my argument that we are moving into more and more a disembodied form of globalization. From here on out, decisive competitive advantages in the global economy will stem less, he's arguing, from low cost production and more from the ability to innovate, robotize and digitalize. So uh, considering the acceleration of disembodied globalization due to COVID-19, reform market globalists like Schwab have actually even ramped up, they have amplified their digital utopia. And they shrewdly incorporate some concepts that play well from justice globalism into their program. So some of those concepts about social justice, equity, and especially sustainability that now becomes a big concept within market globalism. 
They put all of their chips on the ability of innovative digital technology to solve global problems, right? And true to their neoliberal sympathies, reformist market globalists emphasize that the necessary leadership to combat global problems like climate change should be provided by business. For them, meeting the ecological challenge of the next decade and beyond requires a corporate-led institutional framework that consists of global public-private platforms for action that are designed to rectify the current problem, the current situation, the context of the great unsettling. So to draw this second scenario to a close, it's important to note that a return to a reformist version of market globalism would most likely help to address some of the global problems that are likely to worsen over the next decade. However, if implemented at all, reformist market globalists would leave the underlying economic base of global capitalism largely intact. And I argue without the implementation of far reaching systemic reforms on the global level offered primarily from the left, from justice globalists, that's where I think a lot of the important ideas coming from, national and transnational disparities in wealth and well-being would continue to widen while top earners around the world would continue from the benefits of the so-called digital revolution and digital globalization. So in this market globalist rebound scenario, neither globalist, uh, neither justice globalism nor religious globalism would make much headway. Religious globalism would simply dread water, having exhausted itself in small scale terrorist attacks perhaps. Justice globalism will continue to suffer from neoliberal attempts to steal and reinterpret and reappropriate some of their best ideas in order to make the neoliberal program more palatable to global audiences. Again, sustainability and global citizenship are two such concepts that reformist market globalism have picked up and have torn from the flanks of uh, justice globalism. So perhaps the only realistic chance for both justice globalism and religious globalism to gain in popularity, and that would be scenario three and four, would be rather unpleasant prospect of major global crises that might be emerging in the 2020s and beyond. I refer to this as disaster scenarios. And we can think of all kinds of disasters, disasters that we can even imagine yet. Uh, most people uh, you know, imagined a health crisis that we're having right now, but I think it was hard to imagine that it would come so quickly and so profoundly. So I argue that unless we're experiencing a real major crisis, again, on the level of the global financial crisis, perhaps uh, uh, COVID or, or uh, uh, terrorism, that it's unlikely that we see scenario three and four to play itself out. But I'm very, very interested in hearing your views on this. And I think that should be part of our discussion. So let me come to an end here by talking a little bit more about scenario five, ideological stalemate, the fifth future scenario. And I think in many ways that might be the most likely, at least that's the one that I see materialize uh, most likely in the next uh, decade. It amounts to a prolonged stalemate between the somewhat weakened anti-globalist populist forces and the slightly waxing, in other words, gaining phalanx of reformist market globalism. So relatively speaking, I think there's a dialing back of anti-globalist populism and a very moderate surge of this techno reformed market globalism. Some recent political developments, such as the result of the 2020 uh, US elections and the latest European election seem to point to the possibility of a roughly equal balance of power, ideologically speaking, and that of course translates into policies between what we might call reformist market globalist centrists and populists. Also notable though, is a clear upswing of the green agenda in Europe that is also reflected in Biden's strong environmental agenda. 
So again, there's a lot of ideological uh, food that can be gobbled up by both populism and market globalism. I think the broadening appeal of ecological issues also evident in the nationalist authoritarian regimes of uh, China and Russia would indicate some good news for justice globalism, but only if it's not being appropriated, only if it's not being sort of uh, uh, incorporated into populism and market globalism uh, or the willingness of green parties. And we have to watch Germany and the German elections in the fall, especially to see what's happening there. Uh, a, a sort of a new alliance between market globalists and greens, or perhaps even populists and greens, although I think that's less likely. However, if such a global ideological stalemate between nationalists and globalists were to last throughout the 2020s, this ideological stalemate scenario would mean that little meaningful progress could be made towards addressing brew, brewing global problems. The resulting political gridlock would increase the chances of systemic crises rearing their heads in the financial world, the health sphere, cyberspace, and the environment or perhaps some noxious combination of several of these. It's difficult to predict what would happen if another calamity of the magnitude of 2008 global financial crisis would hit the world in the 2020s. Certainly, I think the big loser would be market globalism. Political history of the last two centuries suggests that the forces of right-wing nationalism might find themselves in an advantage at that time because they have proven to be more adroit in using people's fears for their purposes than the globalist center or the cosmopolitan left. So that's not good news for cosmopolitans. The resulting shift to authoritarianism or even worse dictatorship, which folks became very, very real in the United States of America on January 6th, might spell the end of the era of liberal democracy as we know it. So that would be a sort of a coming back to scenario one. And yet, in the face of such new crisis, it's obvious that the world would need a fundamentally different vision of what our planet could look like. Perhaps the ultimate outcome of such a prolonged stalemate scenario would be the narrowing of the contest between the national and the global imaginary to a struggle between two ideologies anti-globalist populism and justice globalism. So let me conclude by pointing to the obvious. I think we have reached the most critical juncture in the history of our species. I don't think that's an exaggeration. Unless we are willing to jeopardize our collective future and that of countless other forms of plant and animal life, we ought to link the future course of globalization to an ism, to an ideology, to an ethic that is global in a sense that it demands the equitable distribution of wealth and the restoration of a sustainable planet. I think that powers like the United States, China, the European Union, India, Russia, Brazil, South Africa, Indonesia, carry a special responsibility to put their collective weight behind a form of globalization and a form of globalism that is not defined by economic self-interest alone, but is deeply infused with ethical concerns for humanity and our natural environment. Perhaps most importantly, the younger generations have a very critical role to play here. And this I think is vividly apparent in the social engagement of individuals like Greta Thunberg and Malawi Yousafzai, who have raised their voices in support of immediate action to educate girls to combat climate change, to move into the direction of social justice. And they're inspiring millions of young people around the world to follow in their footsteps. Ultimately, the future scenarios that I laid out in my talk tonight, uh, tonight are inextricably intertwined with matters of ideology. In other words, the kinds of ideas, values, and beliefs about globalization and its social practices 
that shape our communities. Ideas matter because they provide the motivation and direction for social action. And ideas in turns are being shaped by material realities and dynamics. And so it seems certain that the great ideological struggle over the meaning and the direction of globalization will not end anytime soon. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. And I look forward to our discussion. In Roland, yes, okay. I think this was once again, thanking you, Manfred, a rare example of conceptual clarity as combined with a visionary approach to an extremely complex ideological situation that is uh, accompanying the reglobalization situation. Um, I wonder though, Manfred, um, being in perf perfect uh, alignment with your analysis, where you locate in, in your schedule um, the new corporations like Google or Twitter, uh, so, so, so to say the, the big co um, information control and distribution companies who wouldn't uh, really assign themselves needed to market ideology nor to justice globalization um, they would say they are some somewhere in between jack dorsey for example a perfect figure would say i'm a bastard between yes i want to make global uh, business and distribute and serve as a, as a as a platform for internationalization but at the same time i'm the guardian of political correctness i i looked at uh, everybody has uh, the right to participate and he comes a, a little bit from the greenish movement and has transformed into one of the biggest uh, neoliberal entrepreneurs so there is a kind of intermediate sphere a bastard sphere so to say which is always becoming more important which is the information control sphere the algorithmic sphere so to say and i think it doesn't fit in our current analysis um, instrumentarium uh, we need new tools to approach this kind of um, hybrid sphere that is becoming so, so important and is out of every um, um, raster or, or current pattern that we have. And the second aspect is where do you locate, as you mentioned, the Fridays for Futures movement or the Extinction Rebellion um, movements. They are neither about justice, globalization, they are not really anti-globalist in themselves, in their explicit ideology, but they have more kind of a cosmological approach. Uh, they, they try to see the whole, uh, even beyond current powers, even if beyond the tripolar power structure, NGOs, uh, states and global bodies, they don't care about most of the patterns of analysis we bring forward, but they just want to save the world. Um, so, so I wonder where you locate kind of hybrid movements that are even more complex uh, to fit into our typological uh, instrumentarium. That would be my question. And I'm very happy uh, that we have lots of good questions, Manfred. We are already beyond schedule, but if you allow us to do so, we will address some of the question because I think uh, your talk was so, so in, uh, inspiring as it always is, Manfred, and uh, it, it is really a pleasure to listen to you that we should give these young people uh, the chance to interfere with you and to interact on some important pillars of reglobalization. Uh, absolutely. Uh, do you want me to address yours uh, quickly or and yeah, then move to the others? Please. So uh, you're absolutely right that we need more research into this hybrid sphere. And I think what you're also pointing out, and I think these are your complexity theory background speaking here, is yeah. that the real world is very complex and tends to be a hybrid. At the same time, as you know, uh, as social scientists, it's our task to create analytical uh, categories and typologies that uh, you know, are, uh, you know, to use the kind of Weberian idea of ideal types uh, that don't really quite exist in the real world, but help us to understand what's going on in that hybridity of the world. And I would say, yes, we need definitely more research into the hybridity, but I still see the Twitters and, and, and uh, the Facebooks and so on 
is leaning towards Klaus Schwab and leaning towards a reformist market globalist vision with the understanding, as I pointed out, that important concepts are being absorbed that come from the green, from the justice globalist movement, such as uh, uh, sustainability. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, ultimately, I think they're still very much committed to uh, that market globalist vision. Uh, and, and you can see that in terms of what sorts of policies uh, they actually support. They were very, very strongly behind uh, neoliberal policies like the cutting of taxes, for example. So in other words, they supported corporate tax cuts. Uh, they are not in favor of redistribution uh, very much uh, of, of the social product. Uh, these are all very important issues for justice globalism. So while you're absolutely right that rhetorically, uh, in an almost new age way, they uh, do uh, refer and seem to embrace some of these justice globalist issues, I think ultimately they are committed to this reformist market globalist, this kind of techno world with a green rhetoric. Uh, with regard to Extinction Rebellion and, and where they stand, uh, that is really, you know, I think uh, for me, a very, very interesting uh, question because it seems that uh, there is also some sort of frustration that's part of justice globalism not making headway that mm -hmm. is spawning uh, sort of a radicalization within justice globalism. And I'm not sure if you would agree that Extinction Rebellion could be part of it, but I think that what they're doing, as you pointed out correctly, is that they're developing this ideology further into this cosmological uh, direction. But yet at the same time, I think there's also a sort of a, you know, an anarchist edge to it that we've also seen in the Occupy Wall Street movement. And I think there's a link to that. So again, I would think that, that these are dynamics that are occurring within justice globalism. Yeah. I completely agree, especially <clears throat> with regard to the big global information trusts who are not to forget hiding the sources. They are not transparent. They don't uh, allow you to understand how their algorithms work, which control uh, information. So they are neoliberal to a certain extent, yeah. So Manfred, thank you for your very interesting uh, talk again. Uh, it has inspired many of our uh, attendees to ask questions. Let me bring forward the first one of Clara Larus. Very nice lecture, thank you. Even though globalization has evolved and for example, justice globalism or populism became more present, for me, capitalism or neoliberal market globalism is still very present in the context of globalization. In my opinion, this also brings to many problems with it income inequality, environmental problems, et cetera. Can we ever expect to end to an American capitalism at some point? Or how could globalization processes look like with a weaker capitalist system? Who could be central actors? Social movements, question mark. Right, thank you. Thank you very much, Clara, for your fine question. I think it's an important question. Actually, it's a, it's a bundle of questions. So uh, let me just briefly address the first thing first. I totally agree with you. Obviously, that comes, I hope it comes out in my lecture, uh, that market globalism has not gone away. It's not as dominant as it used to be. And parts of uh, market globalism is, have actually been embraced, as I pointed out, by populists of all people. So for example, Trump's uh, you know, tax cutting uh, and deregulation of industries, especially environmentally related industries, are classic neoliberal measures. Uh, and uh, obviously market globalism also uh, persists in terms of its reformed uh, Klaus Schwab uh, visions. You're absolutely right about that. It's still an important player. And I would never argue that uh, it's sort of, it's going to disappear over the next decade, but I don't think its footprint is as strong as it used to be in the 1990s and 2000s. And it also had to be altered ideologically. Now, can we ever expect an end to American capitalism at some point? I think everything comes to an end. The question is when and what the time horizon is. I think society always changes. I mean, it, you know, these are the questions perhaps that under feudalism, uh, you know, peasants were asking, can we ever expect an end to feudalism? Uh, it looked impossible at the time, uh, but it did happen at some point. So I don't think that capitalism is eternal. American capitalism is not eternal either what the time frame for that is, is a different issue. I don't think we can see an end to American capitalism in the next decade or two. I think that would be probably unlikely. And what would globalization processes look like with a weaker capitalist system? 
I would argue a more regulated one. Again, there are two options, right? Uh, the first option would be the kind of uh, Joe Biden option, which is a sort of a little bit of a return to Keynesianism, to uh, a, uh, a, a weakening of, of deregulation, a weakening of privatization, a weakening of liberalization of trade in terms of making nation states again, stronger players. Uh, so that would be, you know, taking the step towards more of a sort of a left uh, populism slash Keynesianism. That would be one way. Another way of uh, uh, what it might look like would be if justice globalism prevails. If God forbid we do have a major crisis uh, and uh, you know, there is a real swing towards the ideas and the movements of justice globalism, we could see uh, rebuilding and transformation of and, and, and new global governance structures that would be uh, you know, possible with regard to solving these global problems. Yes, social movements are the main drivers in this. I think social movements are also the main drivers within, as we've seen, that sort of Keynesian uh, return to Keynesian uh, uh, sort of capitalism in a sense that African-Americans, for example, were major, major drivers in the success of, of Biden's uh, uh, election. So yes, social movements are extremely important. Thank you, Manfred. The next question is by Alade Julius Oluyede. I hope I spell it well, Alade. She um, asks, I'm appreciative of the issues raised here. I see a future return to the resolution of the mismanagement of global capitalist infrastructure by a selected elite group of managers to apportion deserved sanctions. In essence, a rise of ideas and concerns couched in Trumpism. Uh, yes, Alade, that obviously covers uh, scenario number one, right, that I was uh, talking about. That's the fear that you have. And I think uh, your question is, is, is uh, you know, important because uh, it expresses the fear that a lot of people have, that perhaps this is just an interlude that we are experiencing now. This, uh, you know, in the United States, this return to uh, quote normalcy under Biden in parts of uh, Europe and Asia, a moderation of some of the populist uh, dynamics. And that perhaps a few years down the road, what we are seeing is a backlash. Uh, and, you know, in the 2024 election, uh, you know, either Trump himself or one of the people who represents his program uh, might win and we might wildly swing back to uh, what you call here Trumpism. And that may then also again set signals for the rest of the world. Uh, I think that uh, the question is who are going to be the select elite groups of managers, right? And I think there's a battle in that sphere between uh, elite groups of managers who for a variety of reasons, including instrumental, purely instrumental reasons, embrace national populism or anti-globalist populism. And there's also a select elite group uh, uh, like Schwab and others who embrace reformist market globalism. And those elites to some extent overlap in terms that, of, that you have instrumentalists in both camps that are willing to make the career in both of these, but there's also some distinctions, so differentiations between them. So I think that the battle, the ideological struggle that I was talking about is also playing itself out in very real terms with regard to this battle among uh, elites. And the question remains to what extent these elites will be able to uh, dominate uh, policymaking without experiencing what Clara uh, was talking about in terms of a, uh, a pushback from social movements uh, who are populist, either left or right, and are therefore anti-elitist. Thank you, Manfred. A next question by Nidas van Dijk. Mr. Steger says that populists are exploiting concerns of voters about cultural change through immig immigration. What, in Mr. Steger's view, could be the correct response to these concerns within a democracy? In other words, if voters say no to immigration, wouldn't it be undemocratic to deny these wishes? Asks Midas van Dijk. Uh, 
Yeah, again, uh, you know, an excellent question. Uh, the whole question of democracy, right? So I think we have to start, uh, we have to back up a little bit here. Uh, and we have to start with the notion that, uh, what does it mean voters say no to immigration? Do all voters say no to immigration? The answer of course is no. Does a majority of voters uh, 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 reject immigration? That we have to go country by country and see if, if, if that's the case. Thirdly, uh, are they opposed to any form of immigration at all? Or are they supporting certain forms of immigration and not others? And finally, what is the level of reflection of understanding that underlies their opinion? In other words, uh, I think education institutions like ours uh, and uh, the public discourse in, in general could really benefit from uh, a discussion that foregrounds the importance of migration, not just in cultural terms, but also in economic terms. Look at the demography of Europe. Look even at the demography of some places in Asia like Japan. Without immigration, the current social welfare system, the current social safety net would not be sustainable. And they, they, we need people, we need migrants. So the question is, to what extent are people aware of not just the cultural issues, but also the economic issues? In other words, what we really are uh, what we really need is not a sudden lifting of all immigration uh, limits. I wouldn't be in favor of that. But we need policies in place that address these underlying issues to educate voters, to converse with voters, to be open with voters, to be transparent with voters, to actually talk to them about their own economic and cultural interests in ways that uh, do not just reflect the, the politicking as usual that, that, we are, that we are used to. That I think is the, the, the very important thing. So yes, currently a lot of people might be against certain forms of immigration, but that doesn't mean that it's edged in stone. I think it's precisely the political process. It's the responsibility of political parties and political leaders and everyone else, including us educators, to actually be capable of conveying to the people what the importance of migration and people's movement is in their lives and why we all depend on bodies moving around on this planet. Yeah, I think this is a very important question because yeah. we certainly have, Manfred, um, I, I know that you um, uh, analyzed this too, we have a crisis of cosmopolitanism at the moment and this is not has not happened from one day to the next this is a has, has been a process of maturation over time and i think one of the big effects of reglobalization will also be that cosmopolitanism itself must question it itself uh, how to go on and how to recalibrate it after trump and perhaps after the next waves of, of populist um, anti-globalism so it's not that there are holy cows like cosmopolitanism is good and who is against it is bad or human rights are good per se and who is against them is bad, but these are more complex processes of recalibration uh, and maybe also of maturation of terms. I don't know if you agree. Yes, absolutely. And it's very complicated uh, yeah. and it's very difficult, but I always feel that especially people who tend to support populists. One of the things they like the least is when politicians try to evade responsibility, when they're not transparent, when they're not speaking the truth, honestly. They, they'd rather have people expressing their opinions that they disagree with in an honest and straightforward manner than trying to be everything to everyone else. So I think we need politicians, we need educators who make very clear in an honest way why immigration is important, why we can't all of a sudden, you know, lift all immigration limits, but how, is, as you put it, Ron, how we have to recalibrate our thinking and our policies in ways that accommodates the reality of a global and globalizing world. Yeah. So we come to the, uh, one of the last questions by Valeria Eichholz. She asks, dear Professor Stegel, thanks so much for your lecture. My question, if we want to fight against this before mentioned market globalism and realize a more democratic globalization, 
what can the individual contribute? Are there examples of concrete action? A question by Valeria Eichholz. Yeah, I think uh, that's why I individualized it at the very end of my talk, Valeria. Thank you for your, for your uh, excellent question, right? Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, uh, think of Malala and what she's done in terms of education for girls, in terms of addressing imbalances between the global north and the global south, in terms of women's issues, in terms of other issues. We can think of many, many examples. Greta Thunberg is another one that I mentioned with regard to ecological issues. So uh, clearly individuals can do something and not all of us actually only a very small fraction will have that gigantic public profile that these two women have that I just mentioned. But what we can all do, I think, is actually vote with our feet, actually get involved, which goes back to the uh, first question uh, about social movements, right? In other words, uh, pick your cause. Is it education? Is it the environment? Is it economic inequality? Is it racism? Is it xenophobia? Is it misogyny? Whatever your cause is, pick a concrete organization and movement that you can support, that you can give time to, that you can give energy to. The world is being changed. It's a, it's, it sounds very trite, but that's always been like that, one person at a time. And we know that collective action is ultimately what changes things. Ultimately, it's more people, more individuals making the decision of joining specific movements, specific causes that are directed towards change. It's slow, it's maddening slow. It doesn't always go uh, you know, three steps forward. It sometimes goes three steps forward, two steps back. It can be very frustrating. It's the long haul. It's what Rudi Duchke a long time ago called the long march through the institutions, <laughs> right? And not just the institutions, but the long march in general the long march towards social justice. As Martin Luther King Jr. once said, the arc of justice bends ultimately towards betterment, but it's long, it's a long arc and it requires a lot of work. We have to retain an optimism, but we have to be realistic enough to assess the situation. And we're not in a good situation, unfortunately, in the 2020s. We have to be realistic enough to base our analysis on what is happening in order to motivate and activate our optimism in the direction of concrete action. So a concrete action for you, Valeria, again, I don't know what, where your cause is, where your sympathies are, but what is a concrete institution uh, or movement uh, uh, or organization that you can jo join or already have joined that you can give your energy to in the direction of a more democratic globalization. Yeah, that was a really motivating answer, Manfred. At the same time, let us not forget that um, being part of a group is not all. You have to form your own consciousness as an individual. Let's just give one example. About 25 to 30 percent of the gay, lesbian, queer movement uh, members in the United States gave the vote to Donald Trump in 2020. Uh, which is a contradiction in itself, apparently. So just to belong to a group or a minority, uh, I don't think that suffices anymore uh, to get a grip on, on re-globalization where, where you can position yourself, just as a footnote. Absolutely, absolutely. That's why, as you know, I, I'm a big, a big supporter of spirituality uh, and, and uh, you know, meditation is, is insight, a retros introspection. It's very important. We have to work on the micro level. We have to work on the macro level. Those two levels go hand in hand. So yes, absolutely. We have to work on ourselves and we have to work in the context of a social collectivity. Yeah, I believe that the, that the rise of a new spirituality or at least the longing for it could be one effect at least temporarily of, of re-globalization. Yeah. Let us come to the last question for, for tonight. We had so, so many really good questions. The last question here is from Linda Girardello. She writes, thanks Manfred for your interesting speech. I have a question about the contradictions that arise when national legal systems clash with global phenomena. 
for example, migration. While immigration is regulated nationally, the phenomenon transcends borders. Also on a level of imagination, migration is increasingly framed as a human right. On the other hand, we see the rise in right-wing populism and national sovereignty movements. Does the birth of a global imaginary thus automatically provoke reactionary oppositional imaginaries that stick to what people have known for decades and therefore appear less frightening to them? The same mechanism could also be valid for climate-related questions, feminist or LGBTIQ plus movements, as well as indigenous rights movements. A question by Linda Gerardello, which will be the final one for tonight. Thank you, Linda. Sophisticated question as usual. Uh, so what I would uh, say is there's a great paradox right at the core of your question. And that is why would nation states or why would the national voluntarily give up power or hand over decision-making to the global? In other words, why would it uh, voluntarily give up the kind of power that it enjoyed for a long time? And I think the answer is under normal circumstances, it would be very difficult. And that's exactly what you're addressing in terms of this tension between the national and international in terms of uh, you know, migration policies, for example. Usually, the national is willing to concede at least some power <clears throat> to new international institutions in a case of crisis. So think of World War II as one of those that saw the birth of the UN, where nation states, at least to some extent, voluntarily gave up some power to a new body that was international. And while obviously it has its problems, it was certainly a, a step in the direction towards this sort of global uh, imaginary that I was addressing. So I think that while crises are always challenging and nobody really wants to go through a crisis, it's hard, but they are very, very important catalysts for change. Uh, you know, Aeschylus said, we learn by suffering. Unfortunately, that's true. So in a sense, crises are also opportunities. They're opportunities for change. And I think that given that we have plenty of crises in the offing, especially the climate crisis over the next 10 years will become very palpable, already it's becoming palpable, but even much more in 2030 than we can imagine now. A crisis of inequality, north-south relations, migration, that nation states increasingly are losing legitimacy. They will see that they cannot solve these global problems on their own. And whether they like it or not, they will be dragged screaming and hollering to giving up some of their power in terms of creating those global institutions. Or, or and this is the, the bad scenario, withdraw into extreme forms of autarky and nationalism trying to close themselves up, off and their populations and pushing the sort of crisis as a disaster that is being perpetrated by things from the outside against the national us. And that's where the battle lies. That's what my future scenarios try to address. That's why we need to act earlier, even though it's harder to act earlier, because usually acting earlier means the crisis is not as bad. And that's exactly when nations don't want to act. But again, I think the catalyst here is going back to Roland's point, change on the micro and on the macro level in terms of people really becoming active players in terms of social movements and change on the micro level as well. And again, I'm coming back to the, to the area of impact that I have chosen for my life, that's education. That's where I'm active. Maybe I'm overemphasizing education. Maybe I'm thinking that education can do more than it really can. But again, I'm an optimist. I'm a believer in education. I think that education can make a difference. And education can take up uh, or, or take many different forms from formal education uh, institutions to uh, informal types of uh, you know, education that occurs online, offline, among groups of all kinds of sizes. But we need to increase our reflectivity, our critical reflectivity. So yes, those tensions are there, especially with regard to immigration. But I think it will become clearer and clearer to people that national mechanisms and national institutions 
will increasingly become more and more powerless in the face of global crisis. And therefore, we need to build up global governance structures that don't eliminate the local, that don't eliminate the national, but join the national and local as equal partners, as equal powers in terms of crafting and designing a future that is, as Roland put it, goes in a more cosmopolitan direction because global interdependence, whether we like it or not, is going to be the critical criterion that we as a species have to move towards. Yeah, thank you, Manfred. I couldn't say what impresses me more. Uh, your answers or the questions. Um, as always, both uh, are very impressive. I think this was the perfect rollout of a sentence that I recall from your last lecture in the first globalization conference when you summarized many things with the sentence, people and we all like to move. And you referred this to migration, but I think it was symbolically referred also to move mentally, to move in a mindset, in consciousness building. And I think we, we uh, and you especially, uh, provided us with a very important and very, very, very impressive contribution to that. So thank you really, Manfred. Um, you're a master, master in the in the topic. Thank you very much, Roland. Thank you very much, Harold. Uh, a special thanks go to Miriam Gruber, who's done a, and, and her team, who've done a fantastic job in putting this conference together. Uh, it's so important that in itself, the conference makes a difference, folks. Don't think that it doesn't make a difference. Don't think because it doesn't reach millions of people, it's about not really. It's it's very very important, and the Center for Advanced Studies at Eurog Research has a key role to play and has been playing a key role. And I'm really very honored and happy to be affiliated with it formally for this year and beyond. And uh, again, uh, thank you to all of you who have tuned in, whether you're part of Europe or not, uh, from different parts of the world, different parts of Europe, uh, to listen to me. And I bid you a good night.